Okay, so uh, when I picked this topic, I thought I was picking something simple. Um, uh, I apologize if you can't hear me. I have a cold, and uh, so what you get is what you hear. Um, this topic uh, would be appropriate for four PhDs and or uh, one evolutionary department. Um, so I'd like to start with a tribute to one man in honor of our presence here in Austria. You all know who he is? Gregor Mendel. And I will move on. <laughs> so causal circularity is the idea that in order to make something a compound X, you need to have it to start. You need to have X to make X. We see that relationship from the very beginning in biology where you need to have DNA to make RNA to make protein, but you also need to have protein to make DNA. Um, and so the loop goes. Um, I don't have an arrow going from RNA to DNA, but in some circumstances, RNA viruses, you have to have RNA to make DNA. Um, but I'm going to focus on the more direct X to make X relationship going forward. This is relevant to the origin of life problem. Um, they like to talk about autocatalysis and replication, with the idea being that once you have X, you can use X to make more X. It is a positive amplification of once you have a compound, you can get lots more of it or you can replicate an existing compound and you have an auto-replication cycle, the beginning of um, the process necessary for, for life. What they neglect is how you get the first thing, how you get the first thing that can replicate or can catalyze itself. So I'm going to look at this problem of where you start, how you get that first thing that you need to get going. Um, I'm going to just pass through this really quickly. I'm not going to describe these things because I don't have time. We can return to this in the questions if you have interest. But hypercycles, chematons, autopoietic systems, and uh, autocatalytic sets have all been proposed as solutions. Most of them have never been done in the lab. There have been a few that have been done. Um, but they haven't solved the problem sa uh, satisfactorily. Um, what are suggestions for the first catalysts? Minerals are a favorite candidate. We have minerals in our systems now that are used as cofactors or even directly. Um, problem is minerals are insufficient. They can't do all the things that are necessary in metabolism. For example, they can't uh, accelerate reactions to the degree necessary. They can't engage in energy exchange. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. I am not a physical chemist or an organic chemist. I would have needed to have a PhD in that. I discovered I would have needed to have all kinds of PhDs to do an adequate job on this talk. Um, so I'm going to open it to questions at the end. Please, please um, engage this conversation. I think it's really important. Um, they. Uh, they function as cofactors, um, but we need proteins and, and other kinds of molecules to um, carry out the diversity of reactions that are necessary in metabolism. And most importantly, um, for this talk, I don't see minerals as involved in causal circularity. And they can't generate the kinds of nodal networks that we see in metabolism, the robust networks that are simultaneously um, stable to change and responsive to change. OK, here, this next slide is just a demonstration of the really re remarkable ability of enzymes to um, engage in rate acceleration to take an, a, a chemical reaction that could take 10 to the 15 years and reduce it to the frame of uh, uh, one second, uh, uh, and to bring it into a frame, a time frame of uh, an, an, a reaction that is uh, much, much faster, so that chemical reactions can all take place in the same time frame. And you can have a metabolism that works, 
uh, together. You don't have to stand around waiting for the other guy. The other uh, thing that's really important for chemistry, uh, some reactions are exergonic, they generate energy, and others are endergonic, they require energy to take place. So you have to have a way to receive and store energy and a way to um, transmit energy to re reactions that require it. Of course, the cell uses ATP. Minerals, not so much. I don't think that they would substitute. All right, so these are features of metabolism that have to be explained. Uh, now, returning to autocatalysis. People who've been studying biochemistry, the first year biochemist knows about autocatalysis, positive feedback, negative feedback. Positive feedback is that interesting phenomenon where you, uh, feed D, uh, you make A to B to C to D and then D, the presence of D causes a stimulation of the first reaction and produces more of itself. It's a runaway reaction. You get more and more and more and more. Uh, we know that as feedback when a microphone goes off the rails and yeah and, and unless you have some means to check the reaction it can it can get out of control um, it does there are phenomena like this there are reactions like this in the cell um, but they are not so common as um, negative feedback reactions where it's actually intended to control um, the metabolism in, in a more tightly coupled way. What about the situation where you actually need the compound to start the reaction? Well, that's the thing I'm interested in, causal circularity. You actually need the thing to start the reaction. The paper that got me interested in this question is this paper here by Kuhn, Pap, and Zazmari from Hungary. They looked at a series of um, organisms whose metabolisms are well-defined. And they made computational models of their metabolisms, the, the whole shebang, and then looked to see what of the compounds the, in the cell were um, required that could not be provided by the cell itself. It had to come from outside. Um, the, the, the organisms they studied were bacteria, and one, um, most of them, um, most of them bacteria that uh, take in food, and then one free living um, photosynthetic alga and uh, one synthetic bacterium that's actually non-existent, uh, uh, actually computational um, bacterium, and a, yeah, that's, that's the set. And they, they looked and they found an interesting thing. They found, this is the, the green alga, its metabolic pathway set. Uh, it looks sort of like a circuit board. Um, they found an interesting thing. All of the organisms had to have ATP supplied to them. They couldn't start with no ATP. They had to have ATP supplied to them. Now, ATP, as you know, is the mo molecule that um, stores energy, transfers energy. Um, and in the cell, the the pathway to make ATP is traditionally thought of as starting with uh, this reaction. Ribose 5 prime phosphate uh, receives two phosphates by transfer from ATP to become PRPP. And uh, I'm not going to remember the name of this. Biochemists, can anybody tell me what PRPP stands for? No? Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, so have you noticed anything about this reaction? What's the problem here? You're making ATP and you're starting out by using ATP. 
In fact, if you follow the pathway, to make ATP, wherever you see an arrow, this pathway goes from a top left, swoops around, and gets down to the bottom left, you use six ATP. Wherever the arrows are, you're using ATP as a cofactor. And in addition, you're using another cofactor called THF, which I'll talk about in a bit. And you haven't even gotten to ATP, you've just gotten to an intermediate called IMP, which is a source of nucleotides. It's one of the, one of the stopping points on the way to make ATP or GTP. So, <clears throat> this is not a viable way to be a cell. You can't, you can't survive if you have to use 6-ATP to make an ATP. But it gets even more interesting. They discovered this. NAD is another important cofactor. It's involved in electron transport. So anytime you need to move electrons in the cell, NAD is the guy you go to. And it has a certain uh, chemical similarity structure, similarity, and starting early in the chemistry of the cell um, with malate, to make NAD, you go from left to right. Um, where you see the dotted line, that shows you where you require NAD to make NAD. Well, you also need ATP. You need ATP and NAD <coughs> to make NAD. Okay, so let's continue the circular path. Here's tetrahydrofolate. It's a cofactor used in the process of making nucleotides of all sorts. And what do you notice? What do you see? Tetrahydrofolate requires itself to make itself, and it also requires ATP and NAD. Okay. And CoA, another cofactor involved in uh, carrying carbons to, uh, in particular, things like fatty acid biosynthesis. Um, interesting pathway here. Uh, you, s you come in one pathway starting from valate, val valate and alpha ketoglutarate, and then it branches in with um, serine, and that's where the CoA comes in. Um, you also need ATP, NADPH, THF, and ATP. So we've got loops within loops within loops. Why is this? Why is this? I've thought about this some, and uh, we'll, we'll come to it. One last cofactor. This is not in their paper, but I looked it up just because I ran into this compound. FAD is like a super NAD. If you want to hammer a nail, you use a hammer. If you want to hammer a super nail, you use a, 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 a nail gun, right? Boom. This is the nail gun version. Um, and it's a really scary looking compound, and it's got a really scary biosynthesis. Um, you start with GTP, and you have to use NADPH, and you have to bring in ribosome, ribos, ribulose 5 prime uh, phosphate, and um, yeah, and that just gets you to riboflavin. We don't actually have to do all that business. We just take a vitamin, and then riboflavin takes you to FAD. It's got a lot of reactive centers, and so it can really, really move um, electrons around. Why would our me metabolic pathways have such causal circularity? This is a metabolic pathway chart done as a subway system. It's simplified, it's organized, it's neat, it's tidy. Um, Tony, where are you? Ah, oh, this is where you live. <laughs> okay, and um, Russ, where are you? Okay, you are up here, like constellation of proteins. C3, where are you? Are you here? Ah, there's transcription replication and, uh, okay. Um, Gunter, you're not here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
This is simplified. Um, where is energy metabolism here? Whoops. Well, you have um, carbon fixation. That's what plants do. And then you have the breakdown of sugars, glycolysis. Whoops, I keep hitting the wrong thing. Uh, glycolysis going to um, citric acid cycle and um, the electron transport, which is what I'm going to talk about now, which is why I bother with all of that. So um, glycolysis, oxidative decarboxylation in the Krebs cycle, in short, broken down, very um, summarized very well. In red, you see all of the cofactors that are involved. And now I'm going to um, show you, <laughs> this is the pathway that's not so simple. Um, citric acid in the center, and I'm going to zoom in, and then zoom in some more. Just to show you, the red is where the cofactors are involved. They're interconnecting everything. They're involved in everything. Here's ATP. Everywhere you see those little red whatevers, um, those are coenzymes with uh, ATP. In blue, they're enzymes. In black, they're substrates. This is where they're involved in transcription and translation, where the white is. So the point is, these, these molecules are really significant for the cell. Here is um, citric acid cycle takes place in the mitochondria. And this is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And this is the intermembrane space. This is the outer membrane. Um, I don't have time to go through all of this, but just to give you a hint um, of the complexity of the metabolism. So this is where um, the glucose becomes turned into energy in a major way. Uh, so the citric acid cycle spits out succinate, and the FAD comes along, and boom, turns it into fumarate. And the energy of the electrons is passed through these complexes of proteins. Hydrogen ion gets pumped out. Then over here, the NAD gets funneled into this complex over here, and hydrogen ion gets pumped out. And then what does that do? Well, gosh, what do we do with all this hydrogen ion out here? What's that about? Well, it's really, really important. It's because you have to have the hydrogen ions to pass through <coughs> ATP synthase in order to recycle ADP into ATP. Why is that so important? We go through our body weight in ATP every day. We can't make that much ATP. I showed you why in the beginning. So we have to recycle what we burn. Here's where. Here's where. And this is ATP synthase. Now, let's do the, the balance sheet. To make ATP, de novo, is a net loss. We generate ATP in glycolysis in the, the Krebs cycle, which is another name for the citric acid cycle, in the electron transport and regeneration in ATP synthase. We use ATP in making enzymes, DNA, RNA, all the synthesis of the cell, in everything in the cell. So in summary, we need an entire functioning cell to make ATP. We also have to have ATP to have a functioning cell. That's what I call causal circularity. No ATP, no start. Now, if causal circularity is common, and this is what comes from the Sathmari paper, this is from their abstract, kick-starting met metabolic networks is impossible even if all enzymes and genes are present in the same cell. OK, take that in. Uh, for those of, uh, of you who aspire to make a synthetic cell, <laughs> pay attention. You have to know what you're going to have to add to the cell to get it to start. <laughs> because if you don't have those compounds <coughs> present, it won't work. Here are the organisms they looked at, the bacteria um, and the the minimal metabolism. All of them required ATP, and some of them, that includes some of the archaea. 
um, included um, some other cofactors. Why do the others not require those cofactors? They get them from their diet. Okay, how am I doing on time? Five minutes, okay. Um, quickly, it's not true just of these cofactors. Circularity exists in proteins. Um, quickly, sulfite reductase is the enzyme that brings sulfur into the biosphere. We can't use inorganic sulfate. This enzyme brings it in as hydrogen sulfide that the um, biosphere can use. It uses a, co a cofactor called iron sulfur cluster here in the active site of the enzyme. It has to hold that uh, cluster in place in the active site using an amino acid, which itself has sulfur in it, cysteine. So in order to get sulfur into the environment, you have to have an amino acid with sulfur. There's the amino acid. <coughs> Causal circularity. Cysteine is a very important amino acid. It's involved in all of these pathways. Um, redox um, it controls um, oxidation. It's involved in um, um, a lot of cofactors, etc. A lot of these processes are causally circular in life. Um, so. I asked the question myself, all right, if, if ATP is so important, is it evolvable? How did we get this requirement for ATP? How could we have evolved it if you had to have it to start? How do you evolve a pathway to make it? So I looked in the literature and lo and behold, a group at MIT had said they could propose an ancient pathway without phosphate. And so how did they do it? They did it by using systems biology where they stripped out all the enzymes involved in making phosphate-related enzymes, and that means eliminating ATP. Um, and also it means um, changing CoA, because CoA relies on a sulfate. And um, so they proposed, I think it was a thioester of some sort, uh, substituting uh, sulfur um, compound. But um, it, also, it also requires eliminating all nucleotides. So I'm, I'm left wondering, uh, what are you left with? What are you left with? <coughs> so uh, yeah, here's where the CoA comes in. Um, to making CoA, the, uh, the uh, cysteine right there is the uh, is, is sulfur, um, and um, NAD is, is um, anyway. Um, it's it's a it's a difficult problem. Here's a one one. Sh this is a, a metabolic pathway for tetrahydrofolate which is one of those cofactors I showed you. Right here is tetrahydrofolate. The cycle of you know, dihydrofolate, tetrahydrofolate. There's vitamin B12, methionine, et cetera. The thing about path the pathways of the cell is that they are very um, interconnected, which allows flux. So if there's a problem in one enzyme, the cell can often shift things around to compensate. Um, and so um, if there's a mutation, for example, in this enzyme, this uh, enzyme here, which happens to be a vitamin B12, um, the cell can sometimes compensate using, say, for example, um, THF or 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Um, why is this relevant? <coughs> well, I wondered, how are we going to figure out the importance of this causal circularity? It's not possible for me to go in as a bioengineer and specifically tweak. I can't take out. Um, I can't take out ATP and expect to test. You know, its role in one in one reaction. It's going to have a catastrophic effect on the cell. ATP is universal. Um, 
I can't target one, one particular pathway because it's, it's not as if it's a, a substrate or a product that I can just tweak. So I thought maybe there are um, mutations involved in metabolism that are already out there and I can look at the phenotypes of those mutations that are informative. Um, so is causal circularity essential? Um, I think yes, um, for these reasons. The cofactors are involved in reaction types. ATP is involved in energy transfer, NAD in electron transfer, CoA in uh, carbon group transfer. Um, they link pathways. Any change to one of them is global. They regulate metabolic flux. So anything you do is of, of consequence to the whole system. It's going to be essential. So the question is, can we look at mutations in metabolic systems in humans, for example? It's well studied now. Yes, um, there are mutations. For example, this is a mutation in a repair enzyme as part of um, an NAD-associated pathway. Um, just lacking a repair enzyme is lethal in early childhood. You, you build up a, um, a lethal, um, a lethal comp uh, compound that, because it doesn't get repaired, is lethal. Here is another uh, <coughs> disease that's caused by defects in vitamin B12 can happen as a result of several different mutations. Um, there are workarounds, though, because of that complex pathway that I showed you. You can treat it by treating with vitamins. If you know the pathway well enough, you can say, okay, if I feed this vitamin, you can, act you can actually mitigate. Okay, I bring this in. The same group, Saswari, that um, did the paper I worked on, they looked at um, one of his scenarios for first life, um, metabolism first, and they came to the conclusion metabolism first won't work. Um, that leaves you with um, replication first, and nobody has an answer to that yet. We now feel compelled to abandon compositional inheritance as a jumping board towards real units of evolution. So. Um, go back. Anybody who's computational here, I want your feedback. <laughs> Can we use human computational methods to address this question of uh, whether it's possible to evolve circularly, circular causally, causally circular systems um, or anything looking like metabolism? Um, is it possible to evolve randomly these causally circular things? Um, <coughs> and here's the final question. <coughs> if causally circular systems are essential, and if they're unevolvable, I would say that's evidence for intelligent design. That's what I would say. The question is, are they essential? and are they unevolvable? So, thank you.